Our next topic is ecosystem population dynamics. Uh, we're going to look at how species grow and change and how their populations are regulated. Um, there are three main factors that determine the size of a population. It's how many are um, added each year, or how many are born, how many die each year, and how many migrate in and out. So we have a formula that we can use for that. Population change is equal to B plus I, which is births and immigration, so that's how you're adding individuals to the population, minus D plus E, which is deaths plus emigration, so it's dying and moving out. Um, if those are equal, the number of individuals added or balanced by those that are taken away, then you're going to experience zero population growth. Different species or different populations uh, grow at different rates, and their capacity is also varies as well. So their capacity for growth is known as the biotic potential. So that is if all offspring survive and there's unlimited resources, what um, is the capacity? The intrinsic rate of increase is how fast the population will reach that capacity, once again, if it had unlimited resources. As long as there are plenty of resources, populations are going to grow. If you look at this graph, we're looking at an example of bacteria. Notice how the growth starts off slow and then the rate increases the more bacteria is added. This is exponential growth and um, it's also known as the J-curve. So as the population grows, the rate of growth increases as well. Alright, so the J-curve assumes that there are no limits on resources, but we do know that in ecosystems there are limits. Um, for example, Darwin said that if you start with two elephants that experience exponential growth, after 700 years, the population of elephants would be around 19 million. Now, we know that we do not have 19 million elephants on Earth today, so resources are limited, so the population growth is not going to continue forever. Usually, it's available resources and competition for those resources that limit the sizes of a population. So each environment is going to have a maximum size that it can contain. That maximum size is known as the carrying capacity and we see it abbreviated with capital K. So back to our bacteria once again. We see the bacteria, our rate has decreased and our bacteria population has leveled off. Um, we could say that its carrying capacity is around 120 bacterial cells because that's the maximum number that that particular environment will support. So it's negative feedbacks. Remember, that's what creates um, stabilization. It keeps that population around carrying capacity. This is called the S-curve or logistic growth. Uh, it starts off exponential. We see that um, slow rate that speeds up and then levels off as it reaches K or carrying capacity. Limiting factors in an ecosystem are what um, prevent a population from going above that carrying capacity. Um, so we see that reduction of the growth rate. So some of those limiting factors can be the amount of food, the amount of water, the amount of living space, sunlight, it depends on what the needs of the species are. When we look at um, this logistic growth, we start off with that slow growth rate, that growth rate, that is the lag phase as they're adapting to the environment. And then after that we see the exponential phase, also known as the log phase, where the population rate, the growth rate increases and it begins growing rapidly. So that's when it's re exploiting the resources. Stationary phase is when the population growth reaches a plateau, our rate has slowed down and we've reached that carrying capacity. In this particular graph, the population's carrying capacity is around 700. The limiting factors that regulate population size can be classified as one of two categories, density independent or density dependent. Density independent means that uh, whatever the limiting factor is, it's not related to um, the density of the species or how many you have living in a certain area. For example, weather, um, a tornado or a hurricane doesn't, it's going to have a negative effect no matter how many individuals you have living in that area. Same thing with a volcanic eruption or forest fire. Density dependent um, have 
um, different effects depending on the population. Like an infectious disease is going to have more of a negative effect if you have a higher density population because there's more individuals in a closer space for that to spread. Um, competition, predation, um, once again the more individuals you have the more competition you're going to have. So this is what leads to that stability or that negative feedback um, around the carrying capacity. Now these factors can also be categorized as internal or external. Internal means they come from the population itself. What is that population's fertility rate? What territory size do they need for breeding? Um, intraspecific, so remember that is competition between members of the same species. External factors have nothing to do um, with the characteristics of the population itself. So these are outside factors, predators, parasites, disease, climate change. Okay, now if an, um, a species exceeds the carrying capacity, there's several things that can happen. So um, one example, there were reindeer that were introduced to an island off of Alaska in the early 1900s. They exceeded their carrying capacity. Because it was an island, once they used their resources, there was, there was nothing left, so we saw a population crash. So what that would look like, um, you start off with that um, exponential growth, exceeds its carrying capacity, and instead of reaching the equilibrium, we see the population crash. Second example, during the mid-1800s, sheep populations exceeded the carrying capacity of the island of Tasmania. Instead of um, completely being decimated, there was a population crash, but then the population stabilized and oscillated about the carrying capacity. So that's our negative feedback that creates that um, stabilization. So when we reach that stable ecosystem, um, and reach an equilibrium around the carrying capacity, there are several things that can regulate the population. Uh, one example, the peregrine fal falcons in um, Great Britain remain fairly constant until the 1940s. There are about 820 breeding pairs. Um, and the reason is because they're limited by the number of nest sites. If there's no nest sites, then they can't breed and have young. Um, the average brood size is about two and a half young. Now obviously you're not going to have two and a half babies, but when we find the average of all the breeding pairs. If we had two and a half young, that's greater than replacement level fertility, so we would assume the population would grow. Um, however, the next breeding season the population was back to about 820 pairs. Um, not all the young are going to make it from year to year. Not all the breeding pairs can find nesting sites. So the population reaches an equilibrium. Um, instead of equilibrium, sometimes what we see are boom and bust. For example, mosquitoes are seasonal. They um, tend to have higher populations in the summer and then when autumn sets in they crash and we see very few in the winter. This is called a boom and bust. Um, and the reason that we have boom and bust is because some species can exploit resources or take advantage of opportunities. Um, locusts are another example. They swarm in by the thousands, eat everything. Once their food supply is gone, they move right along. So another example of boom and bust. So the species that we looked at, the falcons were equilibrium, the locusts and mosquitoes were boom and bust. Um, these are two different types of population growth. So from this, we get two types of life strategies. The equilibrium or K strategy species, those that um, have reached equilibrium around their carrying capacity, remember K is carrying capacity. Then we have our opportunist or R strategy species. R stands for intrinsic rate of growth. So how would the species grow with unlimited resources? All right, so our K species are those that are right around the carrying capacity and R are those that are still growing exponentially or they're at that intrinsic rate of increase. So looking just at K strategists, they tend to have a low reproductive rate. So they're only going to have one or two young at a time and they take care of their young oftentimes for several years. 
they mature later, um, so they don't become full grown within days. It might take years. They grow slowly. They tend to be larger organisms. Late successional species, which means that um, they take longer to develop and grow after there's been um, an ecological disturbance. They tend to be specialists in their ecosystems and require a very stable environment. So they would have the S-shaped curve graph because they're right around carrying capacity. Um, all of the animals that are in this slide are from the North Carolina Zoo. They were born several years ago. Um, we've got uh, the baby gorillas, the baby giraffe, and this past year there were some baby lions born as well. Our R strategists are those that have a very high reproductive reproductive rate, usually insects or I uh, think our cane toads, remember that laid our 40,000 eggs at a time. They don't take care of their young. Once the eggs hatch, um, the young are on their own. They mature very quickly, oftentimes within days they're fully grown, um, so they grow very quickly. They tend to be smaller organisms and pioneer species, which means after a, a disturbance they're the first to appear, so weeds would be an example if we're talking about flora. They're generalists. They tend to not have um, a specialist role in their ecosystems, and they can very quickly adapt to variations as well, which is why species like the cane toads tend to do very well. They grow exponentially, so they have the J-shaped curve on their graph. Now, most organisms aren't going to be um, all the way at the end of the spectrum, R or K. Most are going to fall somewhere along the line. It is a continuum. Um, we show characteristics of both strategies because we can adapt well to many different ecosystems, yet we do have few young and tend to take care of our young. But we know that the human population is still growing exponentially, so we're on that J curve. Now switching gears, looking at another type of curve is survivorship. Um, and this has to do with lifespan. At what age do the organisms tend to die? Um, there are three different categories. Type 1 is late loss. Um, they usually die later in life. So these are large mammals, our humans. Um, type 2, age doesn't play a factor and when the organism dies they have constant mortality. So they're just as likely to die as a child than they are as an adult. Um, birds tend to fall in this category. Then we have early loss. They tend to die as young. So that's why certain organisms lay thousands of eggs at a time because a lot of times they will die very soon after they hatch. Fish would be an example of an early loss organism. So here are a few other things that we can look at. Um, uh, humans tend to die at an older age. Birds, doesn't matter. They're just as likely to die when they're young as when they're old. Um, and then we look at um, plants here. Our, our, our trees tend to live a little bit longer, um, but not every acorn that falls off the tree is going to turn into another tree. Um, so that's why we consider those early loss.